We're joined by Joseph Humeyer. He's executive director at the Center for a Secure Free Society. That's an independent, nonpartisan, global research and educational center that's based here in Washington. Um, of course, uh, Michael Voss touching on the fact that the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State will be leading this delegation to Cuba. What do you expect to come of that uh, that get-together? Well, it's an interesting time for a visit. I think it's accelerated a little bit from the announcement that the president made last month. Uh, I expect a couple things. I expect uh, she's probably going to make some uh, statements related to migration patterns. Uh, you know, the migration from Cuba to Florida particularly has been heavy uh, all throughout the embargo period, all throughout the Cold War. I think she may look at eliminating some of those migration restrictions so that they can, uh, like perhaps one of the oldest policies, the wet foot, dry foot policy, uh, I think that might be something that would be up for discussion, uh, but that might cause another debate in Congress. Uh, you know, uh, Sean was talking about smartphones, all this kind of stuff that can happen, and yet uh, I was discussing this with him earlier this evening. I was in Moscow after the, mm -hmm. the gates opened up, and, and I talked to somebody in the telecommunications field, and they were talking about equipment issues, you know, workflow issues, systems issues. It, it looks great on paper. Getting all this stuff to kind of overlap is a lot more difficult, isn't it? Yeah, well, te Mike, technology is not the problem in Cuba. They have technology. It's getting access to the technology. Only certain people in Cuba can get access to certain amounts of technology. That's because it's controlled by a regime that generally tries to limit communication, limit people's abilities to access different technologies and freedoms because they don't want them to look at what's going on in the outside world. As long as they're confined and contained to what their reality is on the island, they're not going to see that there may be perhaps a, a different way of living and a different way of running a government. Government. That's, uh, I think, at the, at the heart of what we're going to look, trying to look for is to try to see some type of change in the behavior and the patterns of the regime. Unfortunately, we're not seeing that quite yet. What, what do you think is going to be the most dramatic change, and, and how likely are we to see it? soon or is it going to be over a lengthy period of time? Unfortunately, I don't think we're going to see any dramatic change uh, amongst the Cubans themselves or the Cuban regime. I think the most dramatic change you're going to see is amongst Americans. And I think you're going to see more American companies, even on things like perhaps the business community, who I think for a long time just maybe it wasn't reality, but perception was that Cuba just no go zone. You can't go there. There's just a restriction there. But actually, that wasn't quite the reality. I, I live in Virginia. For Virginia, for example, exports apples to Cuba. So it's people that are in that industry knew that. Maybe the broader uh, industry uh, uh, didn't know that, a broader businessman didn't know that, they might start to pay attention to what actually is allowed to go to Cuba, what actually restrictions there are, and, and maybe find some opportunities there. Uh, Sean just mentioned United Airlines uh, wanting to have flights from Newark and Houston. Um, do, you know, I, I guess that's a, that's a piece of this that a lot of people have been clamoring for here in the United States for some time, which is the tourism piece of all of this. Um, is that an area where we'll see a, a big change over time, you think? I think so. I mean, they, they've, that's one of the areas that I think the president and that's going to be opening up tourism, telecommunications, agriculture. So these, are, but this isn't free trade. This is managed trade. This is trade that's managed by the Cuban government and the Obama administration, and they're selectively uh, looking at certain industries that are going to be able to operate. There's plenty of industries and plenty of businesses that still won't be able to do uh, work inside Cuba, and I think that's essentially going to not going to, one of the reasons that the Cuban government is not going to prosper. But but you tend to look at this as though it's a closed environment. Little things can trickle mm -hmm. in, but but we've seen over in the past, a technology comes in, mm -hmm. things have a way of changing uh, rather rapidly sure. uh, and there are some who take the other point of view which is you know look this stuff gets in there and things are going to just change uh, you would disagree? I, I, no, I would agree with the point that technology travels faster using than government bureaucracy, and then there's ways that you can use technology to actually open up a society. What I would disagree is we, we can't underestimate the nature of the grip that the Cuban regime has over its people. They've spent over 50 years of learning how to cu cut restrictions. I, ironically, I would say we're one of the most successful at doing it. Uh, they are well aware of the way technology can actually be a threat to their own power, and they are taking many proactive steps to cut it. I think one of the reasons you see telecommunications being being an industry that's been selected by the Castro's and the Obamas to be able to open up in Cuba is because the Castro regime knows exactly how that uh, industry works inside their island and they can manage it and they can manage it toward their favor. Joseph Humeyer, thanks for coming in. Absolutely, Mike.